so I'm going to do a short talk to share some of the key findings from the book. Um, so I wrote it in partnership with Shane Richmond, who's here somewhere. He used to be, there he is, uh, technology editor of The Telegraph. Uh, and to contribute to the book, we did a number of interviews with senior executives within the industry and then a survey with 110 executives at, at MD level and above. I'm going to start off by um, setting the scene. I'm going to share a, a scenario that we think is playing out in the banking industry uh, before going on to talk a little bit about some of the challenges uh, to changing with inside a bank and to share uh, this idea that we have for launching a beta bank. So first of all, I'm going to start off with a, a story. So uh, Jan Kuhn was born in 1976 in, in the Ukraine. In the early 90s, along with his mother and, and grandmother, he moved to Silicon Valley and took a job at Ernst & Young uh, as a security tester. A few years later, he was working at, at Yahoo, um, but quickly he realized he wasn't the type of person to work for someone else, and in 2009, launched a business. In 2014, just five years later, that business was bought um, by Facebook for $19 billion. That business, WhatsApp, at the time of its acquisition, had 450 million global users, which is 7 million more than Vodafone had at the time. There was more WhatsApp messages being sent than the total global volume of SMS. But the amazing thing about the story is not those figures, but there was just 55 people working at WhatsApp at that point in time. Um, a phenomenal story, but it's not the only one out there. So in many different sectors, whether it be travel, telco, or media, there's a whole new breed of company that are competing with the incumbents that are largely driven by technology. So the question that we set out to explore with the book is, might the banking industry be next? And, and this chap here, actually in the late 90s, came out and said this. A few years on from that, the players are still here, but you've now got the likes of Mark Anderson saying we could reinvent the entire industry. And you've got leaders like Jamie Deanon, chief exec of JP Morgan Chase, starting to wake up to this risk. Now, everyone in the room, I think, is largely on the same page. There is a lot of activity happening in the banking space. I'm not going to go into details of it now. In the book, we outline how we see the, the, the retail banking model being unbundled and who's doing it. So we pick leading uh, businesses from the space. And you can see here from the Lloyds website the different businesses and what they're picking off. There's a lot of talk going on about disruption in banking. And I think you know, it was interesting for us to take a step back and actually try and work out what might be happening. And we think there's a three-stage scenario that's underway. And that is that the incumbents are being displaced, diminished, and disintermediated. So I'm going to just explain those. Then I'm going to give an example using an adjacent sector and then, and then share how we see it happening in, in banking. So the first stage is that uh, an incumbent player gets uh, displaced by a new entrant. So it's a new entrant that has a better customer experience uh, and often a better pricing model. The second stage is that the incumbents get diminished. So there's a risk they get relegated to being a utility in a marketplace where there's higher rates of switching frequency. And the final stage is that the arrival of a new technology disintermediates the incumbent completely. So hopefully that makes sense, and I'm then going to explain with telco and, and come back to banking. So the first stage is, is this idea of being displaced. And so uh, Apple launched the iPhone, um, and that really changed the game in the telco space. So all of a sudden, someone else owned the customer experience and, and displaced the, the telco operators. OTT players like WhatsApp and others arrived and built services on top of the phones. And what happened is the key features were migrated away from telcos into these players. So what's happened here is you know, the relationship used to be with them, the telco, and now it's with these, these third parties. The second step is this idea of being dis diminished. And there's two really interesting examples in telco, which we're going to later apply to banking. First is the soft SIM. So last year, Apple launched something called the soft SIM in the iPad. And what it enabled people to do is to choose which carrier they went with. So they could choose the carrier based on the best network coverage at any point in time. But it was still required the customer to actually have to change. This year, there was a, a new launch. This is Project Fi. So this is a launch um, by Google earlier this year, I think in February. And it's only available for people who've got the, the Nexus, I believe. But it now does the switching automatically. So if I'm a, a Fi customer and I'm walking along, it will choose the, the best 4G carrier or from one of a million uh, free Wi-Fi hotspots across the country. And it will seamlessly bridge me between these as I'm walking. And it will pick based on price, network, and I just won't even know who it is that I'm with. So this is an example of the, the second stage. And then the third one is this idea of disintermediation. And so this is a suggestion that a new technology might arrive that challenges the core competency of the existing players. 
In Telco, there's a couple of interesting things happening. Google are launching something called Project Loon, which is delivering um, Wi-Fi. Facebook have bought something called Titan, which is a drone business delivering Wi-Fi. But there's also this idea that there's just ubiquitous Wi-Fi throughout the cities. And so, you know, the core competency of a telco is having a network of um, masts that can deliver connectivity. But this arrival of, you know, new technologies then disintermediates that incumbent completely. So hopefully everyone's still with me and still making sense. I'm going to now um, apply it to banking. So this idea of being displaced. The luxury that the new entrants have is they're unencumbered by legacy. So legacy technology, legacy processes, and the likes of TransferWise can build really interesting experiences, often at a, a much better price. So you've got the likes of TransferWise, Level Money in the US, which is an example of a personal finance manager. And these guys are really leveraging the freshness of their operating model and, and their business. This is an interesting chart I pulled from The Economist. So a lending club is one of the fastest growth peer-to-peer -peer players. And this is a comparison that McKinsey and Liberium did, looking at their operating model and the cost of it. And so these guys have got a completely digital business model and accordingly are able to pass that cost saving on to their end customers. So this is the first example of this idea of being displaced. There's new people coming in with a better experience and a better pricing model. What's going to accelerate this, I believe, is this, the arrival of um, PSD2. So PSD2 is a European commission um, that's going to come into play next year. And it's going to require that banks offer APIs. And so non-bank entities will be able to initiate payments on behalf of customers, but also will allow them to get access to account data. And I think before, it was very difficult for these new players to really penetrate as they might have been able to. But with this changing next year, I think this threat of being displaced is really going to uh, accelerate. This next step is the idea of being diminished. This is just a potential scenario. So imagine I'm using a personal finance management tool, something like Mint, for example. The service knows, based on my spending activity and what I'm doing, services that I could switch to. And it's this idea that something could come in and, and, and move me around more easily between things. Well, actually, there's already examples of this. So this is a startup called Max My Interest, which is in the US. And it allows people to bridge their savings between multiple savings accounts to ensure that they have the best rate at any point in time. That's already happening. And that's at the kind of the money management layer. If you then look at the, um, the payments layer, imagine a scenario where you've got a, a device like a, a digital wallet that at the point of sale when you're making a purchase, it decides where the money should come from. Does it come from your debit card? Does it come from a credit card that gives you air miles? Does it give you, come from something else to give you rewards? That's potentially already going to happen with Apple Pay. So they've made a suggestion towards this with their most recent update. So they're going to proactively suggest which cards people should use when they're shopping in a store. At the moment, it's, um, it's limited to, to store cards, but who knows where that might go beyond. And in both these scenarios, you've got the money management interface and the payment interface, where there's the new player that's relegated the incumbent to the background with potentially automatic switching. And the final stage is disintermediation. And we use the example of ubiquitous Wi-Fi for, for telco. In this space, you've got the arrival of blockchain and blockchain-inspired technologies. So I have to admit, I'm still brushing up on how it is the blockchain really works. Um, but its, uh, its effect could be really profound. Um, so you know, the idea is that a bank is very good at being able to store and move money. But what if I actually don't need that, that network to facilitate that activity? And blockchain may enable that. And people um, far wiser than me have already come out with suggestions of uh, you know, that potentially being the case. So this is the stage-by-stage -stage scenario that we see playing out. This idea of being displaced at the interface, diminished as um, higher f switching frequency happens, and then finally the threat of disintermediation with the arrival of a new technology. And here's the comment from the smarter people than me, so the Bank of England. So a lot of people talk about blockchain uh, or Bitcoin being a fad. But I think there's a, there's a very interesting paper that the Bank of England published late last year talking about its potential uh, and far-reaching impact. So lots of change happening, hopefully an interesting scenario that's playing out. Uh, and, and when we were writing the book, we wanted to speak to executives about why they thought change was hard within, uh, within banks. And there was three key themes that came out. People, culture, and technology. The first element is it's very difficult to do things in a different way. So 
businesses become very successful by executing the same model. And this idea of involving customers in the design of products is something that's new to banks. And so when we were speaking to banking executives, many of them said they didn't think they were able to react quickly enough to changing customer needs. It's a different world now. If you look at the, the chief executives of banks across the whole of Europe, every single one of them, their background is in a physical branch model. This is a new world that we're operating in, new, new operating models, new servicing models. And it was interesting to get this feedback that the leadership at the top weren't um, familiar with th this digital world. Then they've got this challenge around legacy so um, and compliance, I should say. Um, so this is an interesting conversation I had with someone that used to be at uh, the BBA, and he'd been speaking to a lot of um, uh, technology leaders at banks, and he'd been saying that you know, there's this challenge of trying to do new things with technology platforms that weren't designed to ever do it. You know, the mainframes were designed to do batch payments overnight, not to serve people in real time in the mobile device. And you know, there's some very smart people in banks, but you know, you're trying to compete with a backlog which has got um, compliance uh, items on it. And when that percentage of your budget's going on to compliance, how can you possibly move quickly? And finally, from Lee, who's going to be joining us in the panel in a second, you've got this risk around, or challenge around, well, if I own that P&L, why is it that I'm going to potentially, or would allow it to be disrupted or challenged in any sense? So, you know, these P&Ls are still phenomenally profitable. So why do I need to explore these new models? And for those three reasons, uh, when we were exploring uh, the book, we felt that, that something new needed to happen. And we uh, believe that banks should launch a, a new bank and launch what we call a beta bank. I'm just going to share a couple of quick ideas from that to hopefully uh, stimulate some thought. So really a beta bank is a fresh start. It's about redesigning from the ground up. It's about new ways of banking, new ways of working. It's about being separate and separate in different ways. So separate you know, from a physical location, actually being in a different working place, having a distinct leadership and being able to really operate in their own um, realm. It's an experiment not just in new products and services and servicing models, but really importantly in different ways of working. It's about being a digital business from the ground up. So not just about digital servicing models, but a digital mentality. So how is it that we work? How is it that we think? How do we engage with our customers and our people? It's a design-led organization, one that believes in design as approach to problem solving, but also one that prioritizes its investment in customer experience. It's not everything to everyone. So if you go and look uh, at a bank today, they've got a whole plethora of products serving a whole plethora of segments across different markets, and that's really challenging, uh, and it leads to complexity. So Beta Bank is absolutely clear on who it's doing, what for, and why. And finally, it's open. So if you go and look at Nutmeg, if you go and look at Lending Club, if you look at TransferWise, they just talk about transparency. It's very difficult as a customer to understand how it is that a bank actually works and why, how it makes money for me. And so Beta Bank is one that's transparent and open. So in the book, we outline a 10-point operating model for how we think a beta bank might work. But I'm just going to share three before we move on to the panel. This first is this idea around leadership. So as I was saying earlier on, quite a number of uh, the banking executives that we interviewed felt that their leadership wasn't um, familiar with digital. Um, whereas if you look at the leaders of the new businesses coming in and competing, they're native leaders. So they're engineers, they're designers. So they're coming from this world. And so I think a beta bank is one that uh, appoints native leaders. The second. Um, really important one is this idea of working in small, multidisciplined teams. So I imagine a decent number of people in the room have worked on large change programs in banks, and I know that this rarely ever happens, if at all. Um, you have huge teams, and people are never dedicated to the, to the project, so it's very hard to move uh, at pace. And then this final one is around designing around modern working practices. So again, I think you could probably walk into... Um, any uh, program of work at a bank in the UK at the moment, and Lean and Agile will be being flung around, and sometimes they'll be doing it brilliantly. But that's trying to operate in a, a broader business which hasn't been designed in that way. So there's compliance, there's legal and finance, which are not set up to work around the Lean and Agile um, operating model. So Beta Bank is one that works from the product development process and designs the rest of its business around that, because that's the true engine room of a, of a business today. So Jack Welsh once said, if the rate of change on the outside is faster um, than on the inside, the end is near. And so our suggestion is that um, for banks to be relevant in 20 years' time, they need to think about how they can design a model that uh, can move at speed. And, and we believe that launching a beta bank is the, the idea for that. So a quick wrap-up. Banks are being displaced 
diminished and disintermediated. It's hard to do change because of the legacy technology and culture. And to create an organization that compete with the likes of businesses uh, led by people like Mark Zuckerberg, we think a bank needs to launch a beta bank.